네, 이어서 이 We will now begin 2022 DMZ Global Forum for Young Leaders Session 2. There are people joining us via YouTube live stream and we are going to have a verification event where you can upload your pictures and we will have a chance to give out souvenirs. Second session theme is future of the Korean Peninsula envisioned by the young generation and the role of young leaders. I would like to ask the moderator and the panelists to come up to the stage. A big hand, please. 네, 두 번째 세션은 session 2 uh, we will have 10 uh, panelists and uh, presenters on stage with us. So please take your seats. So the four presenters, okay, so we have the four presenters and five discussants. Mm. Mm. As we prepare the forum, we have all the themes planned, and uh, these presentation themes are all uh, sort of aligned, which is why we have uh, everyone seated in a particular order. So, session two will be moderated by Dr. Myung-Soo Lee, Senior Fellow at NYU U.S. Asia Law Institute. Once again, a big hand for the session two panelists and discussants and the moderator. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Myung-Soo Lee, and I am going to be moderating session two. When I came here this morning, I was very happy because I've participated in many international conferences and academic seminars, but uh, no other conference or seminar really has such wide uh, participation by the young generation to dream about the future and what role the young people can play in realizing that dream. So, uh, and it's a great honor to be meeting uh, this wonderful uh, lineup of uh, speakers and uh, especially, I would like to thank uh, Professor Mi Jung Im, and uh, she told us that DMZ can become a peace and life zone. And if it's a dream, I don't want to wake up from it. And uh, it was a very inspiring uh, presentation. Thank you very much for that. But so we, we will have to talk about that dream, I think. So from here on, I'm going to introduce to you our panelists, but I am not going to just uh, tell you their names because I want think it's important for you to know uh, a little bit of a background of these uh, young leaders in order to really uh, get into the discussion. Our first speaker is Konju Kim, and uh, she is a current student at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies, and she also is a part of an organization with about 20 members who are very committed to their studies, and they are also having many different types of campaigns. And I believe that she also is helping uh, with other tasks and in charge of India in the task and she has many dreams and please give her a big hand. She is the president of the Korean Peninsula Research Club of Hanguk University of Foreign Studies. Next, we have with us uh, Jack Greenberg. He was originally from Canada, but now he is a graduate student. Are you in the PhD program? Oh, sorry, master's program at the Korea University uh, GSIS. But before that, he has worked in uh, many capacities. And in fact, he has been working with the Setomin, the North Korean defectors here in South Korea, and he teaches them English. 
and uh, you may know of this media. This is an English news outlet uh, that focuses on North Korea, and that is NK News. And there is uh, NK Pro, and he is a contributing analyst at uh, NK Pro. Uh, so, excuse me, Korea Pro. And uh, he's contributing to Korea Pro. So, can you please stand up? Uh, say hello. Good afternoon. Next, we have the third presenter, who is Gabriella Burnell. And actually, it says uh, she's from US, but that's a misprint. She's from the Netherlands. She studied in Paris and in London and is currently in the PhD program, receiving a scholarship at the North uh, University of North Korean Studies. And I don't know if you've ever heard Arirang Radio. Each Wednesday, there is a program called North Korea Now. And she is a guest on that program talking about North Korea. And she has actually reported on North Korea in many different news outlets. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Kyung Hoon Chang, and uh, he is the president of the uh, student council at Hansei University. And uh, he has been supporting uh, students uh, who are in the uh, 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 vulnerable groups. So can I have Kyung Hoon Chang stand? And uh, Kyung Hoon Chang will be discussing the presentation by Konju Kim. Now our second discussant is Ran Kim. She is going to uh, comment on Jack Greenberg's presentation. Ran Kim is a student at George Mason University, Korea. She had studied in Malaysia prior to that, and during her studies there, she translated a lot of works, and uh, she has taught English, and uh, she is now in the Conflict Analysis and Resolution Program. And uh, she is presently an intern at the Peace and Conflict Study Center Asia, and he participates in the Korea US uh, Young Leaders Forum. So that's uh, Ron Kim. Next, I would like to introduce actually, I think I left somebody out. Sorry, Lee Young Chan. Sometimes I make these mistakes. And the fourth presenter is Lee Young Chan, and actually, in your brochures in the booklets, it will say Lee Sejong. It's because Lee Sejong is the founder of uh, Korea Peninsula Policy Consensus Organization, and there was an unforeseen event. But um, this is an organization that pursues consensus, and we have Young Chan Lee who has worked with Mr. Sejong Lee who works at the Korean Peninsula Policy Consensus, and so he's going to present uh, the presentation on behalf of Sejong Lee. And uh, he is currently a student at Yonsei University, and uh, he also uh, participates as a panelist on JTBC uh, Current Affairs uh, uh, panel. Next, I would like to introduce Che Ji Hee. She is a journalist. and will be talking about uh, Gabriella Burnell's presentation. She is a designated discussant. She is a reporter for D News. And I think she, she is an advisor to the presidential committee. So can you stand up? Thank you. Next, we have with us Peter Ward. He was born in the UK, uh, but uh, he has come to Korea where, uh, and he has studied uh, history in Korea University and uh, he uh, received his PhD uh, from the University of Vienna recently, but uh, he's better known uh, for 
working as a contributor to NK Pros, NK News. Last but not least, we have Park Kyu-wan, who is doing something very important, currently a student at Gongguk University. And is a part of the Unicorn Youth Reporter Group at the Ministry of Unification and has been monitoring the, what the government has been doing in this field and has been covering this and has been uploading articles on the website. And there is the Tong Tong People Group, I think the name. And there is a particular group at the Ministry of Unification and was able to visit the border areas and has been working to come up with recommendations for different policies. And I think it's a great opportunity given to you by the Ministry of Unification. So thank you for your efforts. So before the first presenter delivers her presentation, let me just let uh, everyone know that uh, 15 minutes are given to each presenter. So we have four presenters and five discussants. So I have a green card. So if we don't want you to pass the 15 minute limit, so I'm going to show you this green card one minute before that 15 minutes are up. And uh, each discussant will be given seven minutes. So please keep to the time limit. And after the discussants have delivered their discussion points, then I will give the presenters to respond back. Uh, so you can comment on the comments delivered by the discussant, or you could answer the questions that the discussants have raised. And after that, I will open the floor for further questions from the audience. So uh, Ms. Konju Kim, please. It is great to be here. I would like to talk about the Green Detente on the Korean Peninsula perspectives of the young generation. I am Kim Gonju, and it is great to be here. I would like to talk about climate change and human rights from the perspective of the young people. Due to the current generation of how young people perceive climate change as a risk factor that directly affects their lives, they are taking serious consideration about climate change. According to the Future of Humanity survey conducted by Amnesty International, more than 10,000 young people between ages of 18 and 25 in 22 countries, also known as the Generation Z, were asked about 23 most important issues that the world is facing, and they selected climate change as the most significant problem of this era. In order to resolve such risk factors, young people are participating in campaigns where individuals can have a positive impact on the environment, such as practicing veganism, zero waste, and plogging. This generation's unique characteristic is that they communicate with people with similar interests through social media while participating. According to the aforementioned survey, most of the youth mentioned that they believe human rights is also important, like climate change, and each country's government must take the initiative. This result shows that protecting human rights is essential for uh, the government, 73%, and government should actually exert more efforts for uh, welfare for the people, which was 63%. Also, for the youth uh, regarding human rights, said that social media plays a very important role. For the young generation, uh, they were looking at the different perspective toward North Korea and looking at social media and big data. It said that because this is media that the youth um, uses most often for unification and North Korean related issues, they an we thought that it was a very good tool for an analyzing. And during the past year, Naver, Down, you Google, and YouTube, and Twitter, we looked at the big data related to North Korea, and as a result, you can see the word cloud on the right. You can see the bolder, the 
words were, they were mentioned more often. So there was the Echo Network bar chart result, visualization of the result, war, uh, ballistic missiles, um, launching of the missiles, and there were a lot of the negative words related to the situation. And as a na uh, result of analyzing the different names, so n names such as Japan, North Korea, uh, and China came up, and you can see that there were a lot of the words that mentioned different missile launches. Also, North Korean defectors, NSC, and the different weapon names, ICBM, ballistic missiles, and um, other types of missiles can be seen. As a result of the network analysis on the right, you can see the different security-related negative situations were perceived, provocation, missiles, and war. And you can see vigilance storm is another recent terminology also what was important was that human rights was also talked about at length and as a result of the emotional analysis you can see negative uh, superseded the positive and you can see attention uh, tense terrible you can see they catch the eye so it seems that based on uh, security issues we have a lot of negative sentiments toward North Korea Regarding to 2021 unification survey conducted by the Korea Institute for National Unification, 10,003 men and women aged 18 and over in Korea were asked about their perceptions of North Korea and 61% of respondents answered they are not interested in North Korea. By age group, 74% of young people in their 20s and 30s answered that they were not interested, accounting for the largest proportion. When the respondents were asked whether the current uh, at regime is a potential partner for dialogue and agreement, you can see there was a less um, people that responded. So we can see that less people are answering positively also. We can see the MZ generation that were born after 1981 that show these responded and the so-called millennials about uh, the 60 percent that they are agreeing to peaceful coexistence and only 18 percent answered differently and a reason behind that is that for the mz generation for unification they believe that they prefer peaceful coexistence because it's not about achieving unification but more about maintaining inter-korean relations without deterioration Gen MZ has never experienced the pre-division era and has never been close to the generation that survived the division. Then about youth and green detente, how can we resolve this issue together? I believe that we, uh, for, for the young generation, they put much emphasis on individualism and for human rights and for fairness, they have a high sense of um, uh, sense. So for these young generation, they believe human rights should be respected. So I think that for green the tongue to be justifiable to the young generation, I think that we need to let them know that the people in North Korea, uh, their, their human rights are not being respected, and this is because of climate change. So we should let them know rather than come out with the old justification. For uh, democracy, we always put emphasis on the vulnerable, so we should think about Green the Talk and how these policies can help the vulnerable, and we can talk about climate change as a new a security issue and talk about development and cooperation that can bring about more consensus and bring about higher interest and participation by the young generation. So concretely, I thought about two programs. First, is to have a program starting with helping the vulnerable in North Korea, North Koreans and to have a joint development cooperation program centering on Kaesong region. So I believe that we can focus our efforts in one area and you can see Kaesong area is near the DMZ border area. So it has an area including um, the environs which has continuity and we have 
550,000 people of Kaesong complex whose lives can be improved so we can provide influence to about 300 people and we can bring about joint synergy. And for the residents of Kaesong area, we can provide uh, many medical facilities and welfare facilities and we can also uh, help bring about uh, notifications and cases of a uh, discharge of water that can affect uh, these areas. And in particular, for South Korea, it can help North Korea uh, with their potable water, with the discharge of the water, and achieve green detente. And we can have modernization of uh, water power generation through this at the end. Secondly, I would like to talk about inter-Korean joint management of the waters in this area. In Korea, South Korea, we lack uh, some water in some cases, and uh, I believe that this can also help North Korea with their lack of potable water. So what I propose is to have different committees that can help uh, research and development of different plans for this area. And in the beginning of cooperation, I believe that we will need to look at ways to revise the laws and enact the laws and to have joint research in the this area with the different rivers and waters. And we can have a system to have joint uh, information sharing and to have uh, these linked to the lambs and to have alerts in cases of different changes of water in water and to have a very stable water provision system and to help the vulnerable with their water resources and to have joint development of different projects and to have humanitarian aid in this potable water area. And I believe that water purification can also help the plants in this area. And I believe that having a um, photovoltaic system to actually help power generation in this area will be very important as well. Lastly, when we continue with our cooperation, I believe that we should increase the area where we can jointly manage the area and have a special organization to manage this area. And around the DMZ area, we can have joint collaboration and we can also have opportunities to look at different uh, artifacts that have been uh, actually uh, hidden in these areas from the past and come up with a big data platform so that we can have integrated management of the water resources in this area so that we can cover more area for inter-Korean cooperation. 33% of the North Koreans cannot have access to safe water and they are vulnerable to waterborne diseases. So I hope that through this environmental collaboration project between the two Koreas can lead to less tension on the Korean peninsula and to have more collaboration so that it can help the situation in the two Koreas and also with the youth collaboration. Well, I will try not to comment and we can go to the next presenter, Jack Greenberg. Good afternoon, uh, 안녕하십니까. My contribution to today's discussion will be focused on the potential for peaceful coexistence between the two Koreas. As I began to prepare this presentation, I'll admit that I did struggle with the topic. Uh, why is that? Well, the prospect of peaceful unification seems to be very gloomy and dark at the moment. With each passing year, whatever connections once existed between the people of North Korea and South Korea have grown more, grown more distant and remote. Uh, Kim Jong-un ascended to the pinnacle of North Korea's power structure, becoming supreme leader just over a decade ago. Many were initially skeptical about this young man's ability to fill the large shoes that his father and his grandfather had left, uh, but he has proved his mettle and consolidated his influence, at least um, domestically. Um, 
and he has purged those who have challenged his authority. At the same time, he has forged forward, uh, successfully advancing his country's nuclear program. The North has managed to grow its arsenal of nuclear weapons throughout both the Trump and the Biden administrations, and despite the crippling economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The past few weeks have seen a growing tolerance on the part of North Korea to use missiles. There has been an unprecedented number, uh, I believe 52 missile tests in the past couple of weeks. And now we're holding our breaths, watching with anticipation as to whether the re regime will push ahead with its plan for a seventh nuclear test. It seems Kim Jong-un is not ready to soften his position, nor will he relinquish the nuclear status that his regime invested so heavily in achieving. In fact, just on September 9th, the North announced that it was adopting a nuclear weapons doctrine, and Kim Jong-un pledged that he would never again entertain discussions on denuclearization with foreign countries. So talks are off the table, at least for the foreseeable future, and with this, the likelihood of peaceful coexistence appears to be little more than a pipe dream. Although Kim Jong-un's focus has been nuclear, he has still shown some interest, albeit limited, in economic reforms. But this has been a, a torturous process. The regime is unwilling to take the necessary risks of economic opening, uh, as this would certainly undermine the preservation of the country's unitary political system, which is so heavily dependent on isolation from the international community. Uh, North Korea will only grow richer if it decides to pursue economic interdependence and integration with the outside world. But as we know, Pyongyang's words and actions show this is something it is not prepared to embrace. Now, you might ask yourself, can we get back to 2017, 2018, when we saw a surprising turn on the North's part towards summit diplomacy? Um, I don't necessarily think so. Without having to commit to denuclearization, Kim got what he needed out of the previous rounds of summits. He managed to raise the strength of North Korea's profile and achieved a certain degree of prestige. There isn't much more room for him to maneuver if he remains steadfast in his commitment to modernizing North Korea's military and consolidating its uh, nuclear program. Um, the pursuit of military and economic interdependence are uh, 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 the pursuit of military and economic goals are interdependent and cannot be easily remedied. The pandemic has also rattled the North's fears about external destabilizers. It, it has stressed Pyongyang's ability to sustain the basic welfare of its population, but it's turned more inwards. It's shut out diplomatic engagement, and as it self-quarantines, it has rebuffed even the most generous offers of aid that have been extended to it. It has dismissed humanitarian food assistance and public health incentives offered under the Yoon administration's audacious initiative, and it has repeatedly ignored vaccine offers from the Biden administration in the UN's COVAX program. Um, given these circumstances, I'd reiterate that the prospect of peace seems quite distant right now. So does that mean we should give up? Does it mean that it's not even worth trying? Of course not. To give up hope would be a grave mistake because windows of opportunity come when we least expect them to. I believe there are opportunities for cooperation in non-political, non-military realms. And I would advocate for the continued pursuit of possible cooperation in the field of environment and climate change. This week, COP27, the United Nations Climate Change Con Conference, is underway in Egypt. It's the 30th anniversary of the adoption of the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and it is a significant milestone. In the past three decades, the world has moved far closer to consensus than ever before on the need to combat climate change. 
We understand the negative impacts that it threatens our planet with. We understand what is driving it, and we can predict with greater certainty its outcomes. And we have more tools at our disposal than ever to combat it. But still, we have significant room for improvement. Tackling climate change requires collective action, and without collective action, an equitable commitment to the rules that govern it by the parties involved, then certainly the outcomes will not be optimal. And thus far, the implementation of responses to climate change have been slow and asymmetrical. We continue to st struggle with in, uh, mitigation and have failed to reduce the flow of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We're not adapting quickly enough, and we have yet to learn with, to live with the effects that have already occurred. This is having irreversible effects on global temperatures, and unless major action is taken now, then temperatures are set to rise between 2.5 and 4.5 degrees by the end of this century. Climate change is undoubtedly a, a global challenge. However, we must also recognize that its effects are case and geographic specific. The Korean Peninsula is one of the most vulnerable regions in the world to the threat that climate change poses. The vagaries of climate change are unconstrained. They carry no passports and they don't discriminate between human borders. And they're already on our doorstep. As many of you will remember, um, the greater Seoul metropolitan area was hit very hard by flooding this past August as it witnessed its highest rainfall in eight decades. Um, thousands of buildings were damaged and at least 16 people lost their lives. During this time, we saw that the need for cooperation is quite critical. River, river flow management in particular, the North opened the Huagang Dam's floodgates without prior notice. And flooding is happening north of the DMZ as well. The Taedong River was inundated in August, and the officially sanctioned Rodong Shinmun described the situation as disastrous. So the beginning of climate change's long-term impacts are already being observed in the agricultural sector with torrential rainfalls and increased frequency of abnormal weather conditions, along with rising temperatures, regional instances of drought, and pest outbreaks. And crop yields have worsened in the south, hitting our wallets as consumers. But in the north, the situation is more devastating. It continues to struggle with frequent food shortages and the risk of famine. This year, we saw bad yields of rice, barley, and wheat. Uh, and these crops were stunted by extreme drought throughout the winter, the worst since 1981. So what we're seeing is not just climate change, it's food insecurity, it's malnutrition, and it's poverty, and all of these are tied together. And of course, given that the DMZ is largely composed of um, forest land, um, there is also the concern and an opportunity for collaboration on forest management. Recent years have seen flames blaze from one side of the military-controlled territory to the other, and it has caused tremendous property damage. This March in Gangwon, we saw a forest fire destroy 15,000 uh, acres of tree canopy, which is equal to 53 times the size of Yoido, where the National Assembly is. It forced over 7,000 to evacuate and required over 16,000 firefighters be dispatched to control it. So the future of our planet hangs in the balance. And it worries me as a young person that countries around the world and their governments are not keeping climate change at the forefront of their agendas. When we talk about it, it's still in silos and in small echo chambers. Too many of our leaders approach climate change reactively rather than proactively. It is something they treat more as a matter of uncertainty than conviction. And even when there is good intention, government institutions are moving slowly because priorities change, programs are altered, and the actors are moving to different places. We need our leaders to care about climate change. We need them to speak out. And we need them to define concrete steps that they will take to prepare for the climate-fueled disasters that lurk on the horizon. 
But this won't happen unless young people, whose future will be disproportionately affected by climate change, psychologically, physically, and socially, come together and amplify their demands for a seat at the table, a formal seat at the table where their voices are valued and integrated in actual negotiations and policy implementation. The future is ours and we need to take the lead in the direction that we are headed. Having now been separated for 77 years, young people in Korea have very complicated views regarding the desirability of unification. Studies show that the older generations are more in favor of it than the young, and that even when it comes to the question of coexistence and peaceful coexistence, support is higher among those are 40, over 40. In the discussions I have with my peers, I often hear two perspectives. On one hand, one group expresses apathy and zero interest in the topic. On the other hand, they express worry that reunification will plunge their prosperous lives into chaos and disarray, making the job market more competitive and um, costing them as taxpayers. We need our education system and the government to help instigate a paradigm shift. Um, with an emphasis on the positive aspects of peace and integration rather than the negatives in contributing to fear-mongering. If the diverse damages threatened by climate change are to be mitigated, we must continuously seek the cooperation of Green Detente with North Korea in the DMZ, and we must seek to foster opportunities to bolster mutual capacity building um, to respond to new and emerging environmental challenges. Climate change is core to South Korea's security interests, but it is also a fundamental building block towards restoring trust and building confidence between the two Koreas. And despite enmity and long-standing military tensions, there is hope as evidenced by the Israelis and the Palestinians' collaboration on climate change issues amidst the ongoing occupation and also in the absence of formal peace agreements in Gaza. Of course, it may not seem like we have much power to affect change in this realm right now. Cooperation is a two-way street, and North Korea doesn't show much interest in coming to the table. But that doesn't mean we are doomed to fail. Prior to its last turn inwards, North Korea adopted a somewhat active posture towards international regimes dealing with climate change, even as it rejected most multilateral norms on other issues. Kim Jong-un himself has said and called on party officials to contain the fallout of abnormal climate conditions. And the English language school curriculum in North Korea does emphasize the threat of climate change. Now might not be the right moment. We aren't gonna resolve the problem by ourselves unilaterally, but we are nowhere we are near where we need to be. So let's not waste the time we have now. Now is the time to have conversations rethink what might be obtainable policy goals and build a solid foundation for future cooperation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Jack. Okay, Gabriela Bonell, Nim. It is great to be here. I am currently in the PhD program at North Korean Studies at University of North Korean Studies. This is not my area of expertise, but I'll try my best. In addition, I would like to express my deepest gratitude for inviting me to this presentation. Um, presenters, especially in the first session, they uh, covered a lot of um, things that I already you know, was going to say and um, things that are kind of similar, so I'll try and keep it as brief and straightforward as possible and, and short. So um, I'll be talking very just briefly about, again, the Green Detente, which was already spoken about today and explained in more detail in the first session. Um, opportunities regarding the uh, Green Detente, um, the role of involving the youth, which is of course why we're here, what we're here to talk about, um, the challenges regarding um, involving the youth, which are many, and then um, how we can move forward um, in this process. 
So the origins of the green detente. So as uh, we already heard um, before, the term is a combination of green, uh, which refers to the environment, of course, and ecology, and detente, which denotes a transition from confrontation and conflict to reconciliation and uh, cooperation. The initiative seeks to resolve the political and military confrontation between North and South Korea through environmental and ecological cooperation. The concept was first proposed in 2012 under the Lee myung -bak administration, and the concept fell under the broader goal of creating a green Korean peninsula to reduce tensions between the two Koreas. The concept was broadly promoted to continue under the following Park geun um, government, um, which, which it did, those goals, and similar goals still exist, as we heard before, under the current Yoon suk yeol um, administration. So opportunities regarding this green um, detente project. So number one is, of course, increasing um, environmental and ecological damage on the Korean peninsula caused by climate change has led both North and South Korea to express their desires to protect uh, the natural environment and ecosystem and to tackle uh, climate change issues. They've both uh, made this very clear on, on various occasions that this is uh, an issue that is important to both North and South Korea. So there is some common ground there. So that that is good. That means there's a foundation to, to work from. And um, as we know also, and as we've seen in pictures also just now, in recent years, North Korea suffered major flooding and drought and other climate-related uh, problems and natural disasters. So cooperation with South Korea could definitely be very beneficial um, in these areas for, for both sides. And joint responses, um, of course, to natural disasters and other ecological issues in the DMZ would be mutually beneficial given that, um, as we heard before, these issues can spill over to South Korea, affect the South negatively, affect the North negatively. Um, so that's something that uh, can definitely be um, cooperated on um, by the two Koreas. And then, of course, deforestation cooperation, which has been an area um, of cooperation for, for a long time, an area that North Korea has particularly taken very seriously for many decades now. So deforestation is definitely something that um, the two Koreas can expand their cooperation on. And of course, cooperation on clean water and on rivers. So North Korea has recently um, really stepped up its efforts in cleaning um, the rivers um, in the north that of course also end up flowing to the south. So this is something that could um, affect, again, positively or negatively, both um, North and South Korea. So river cooperation with rivers is definitely something that is um, important for both sides. And then, of course, um, sharing technological expertise with North Korea to better deal um, with natural disasters. That's something that South Korea could help them with and, um, and help kind of um, prevent um, worse uh, uh, effects and the aftermath of natural disasters as we've seen in recent years. And of course also inter-Korean um, cooperation led involving um, international organizations to also bring in more expertise. Now this was done in the past. Now with, with COVID and the borders closed um, in North Korea, that has become um, largely impossible, very difficult. But um, as the borders begin to open, which they likely will soon, they already are, um, this could become uh, possible to bring in not only South Korean experts, but also experts from the UN or from other um, countries that, that North Korea has worked with before, particularly European countries. That's something that um, could definitely bring a lot of uh, beneficial um, results for both, both Koreas. So regarding the youth, so Number one thing that I believe um, is very important is the is education, definitely. So teaching the youth why green detente matters. Like first of all, what is it? I'm sure if you would ask, a, you know, a random young person on the street in South Korea now, what is green detente? You know, in the context of North Korea, I'm sure most of them would have no idea what to say. They wouldn't really know what it means. They wouldn't know why it's important, and they probably wouldn't care that much either. So that's very important to teach them what it is, why it matters, and more broadly, definitely, why inter-Korean cooperation matters. That's very important because I don't think enough uh, young people see it as important at all, really. And how can this benefit them in the future? Because again, you know, we live in a, especially South Korea, it's an increasingly individualistic society and people are becoming more 
you know, focus on, on them and how can this help me, how can this help my future. And if we can teach these young people that, you know, working with North Korea on these issues is actually something that could benefit you in the future, could benefit everybody, and could really have positive um, effects for the whole country, and which would positively affect your life, that's something that um, may change their way of thinking, which is very important. Also, um, incorporating inter-Korean cooperation um, in the subjects dealing with the environment at school, for example. So schools already teach, you know, in geography or in, you know, other lessons, they, they teach about the environment, obviously, every school does. But um, it would be interesting to have a, you know, mini class or a subject um, in all schools that would teach about, for example, the DMZ and, and what what kind of um, the biodiversity in the DMZ, these things. Because I'm sure in Korea, just like in other countries, the students learn about um, the environment and climate change. And clearly it's very important to young people, you know, climate change, they go out and protest about it and all that, but they are not very aware about what is right in their backyard, which is the DMZ. And that is very, you know, that is unfortunate. So that would be very, very important to um, to incorporate in, in school curriculums if possible, that would be good. And then of course, creating more programs where the youth can visit the DMZ. I think that was spoken about also in the first session and learn more about the unique environment of the DMZ area. So that would be very important, of course, if um, security situation allows. And another issue I think is very important is besides government-led programs, which is what is usually uh, done in the area of um, inter-Korean corporations, also involving youth in this sense, youth-oriented civil society or just you know, other civil society organizations to get involved and um, providing extra training for middle and high school teachers on inter-Korean cooperation and green cooperation. I think that's very important because you know, the students won't be able to learn if the teachers don't know how to teach these subjects. So it's definitely important to provide this kind of training for, for the teachers. And like this, like what we're doing today, you know, making more forums and platforms available um, for the youth to share their unique ideas on um, inter-Korean green cooperation, the development of the DMZ into a peace zone, and tackling environmental issues facing both both Koreas. This would be a very good way to get those ideas flowing and to see what um, what the youth think. So, like this kind of a forum, and also creating the possibility for inter-Korean youth exchanges center to ground green development at the DMZ. Of course, this is more of a long-term perspective um, goal, but that would be very beneficial as well in the long term. And then for the challenges, which like I said, are very many. So of course there are opportunities and that can make it sound very you know, hopeful. And I'm sure that's what most, you know, what, what most of the um, speakers have, have kind of been going for, for that, you know, hopeful. <laughs> but there are a lot of challenges, um, a lot of realistic challenges. Since I study politics, especially North Korea's um, politics, um, it's not easy. So inter-Korean -co cooperation in any area is usually very dependent um, in, on improving the political situation. The youth, all, the youth alone cannot play a major role in green detente unless the government helps create the foundation in which this becomes possible. Otherwise, the youth can be you know, interested and wanting to do something, but if that foundation isn't there, then there's not much they can do, really. Um, then number two, of course, as we've discussed, lack of North Korean interest. Um, in the first session, it was it was um, spoken about how North Korea is interested on the international level about the climate, and that is true. North Korea has been very, very um, involved in uh, um, climate agreements for many years now. But that's, there's a difference between that and being interested in specifically cooperation with South Korea. They're not that interested in that. Um, so that, that's, that's the problem. Um, and then North Korea's, of course, independent self-reliance attitude. That's their whole uh, motto that's always been, the Juche ideology, the, you know, we can do it ourselves. We don't need anybody else. That kind of way of thinking that is probably not going to change for a long time that is something that um, we need to also take into account. 
Um, of course, also difficult to um, expand cooperation beyond um, the government to government level, like I said. It's difficult to involve um, civil society organizations because of legal constraints, um, constraints around, um, you know, national security law, for example. Um, the information that people can get about North Korea is very limited still. Um, the information South Koreans can get. Those problems are, are still very, um, you know, very big problems. And limitations, of course, on teaching about North Korea, like I said, that's related to that, in a, a non-political and neutral way. There's lots of, lots of um, um, obstacles to, to get to that. And then again, stereotypes, which we saw in the first presentation um, with the, the words, the terms that, you know, what do young people think when they think North Korea? Um, missiles, nuclear weapons, um, you know, Kim Jong-un. It's not, it's not, you know, these, these stereotypes, this way of thinking is something that um, is a big obstacle to, to getting people involved, getting them interested in, or getting them, you know, even talking about these topics. Then, of course, on internationally, um, cooperation, um, sanctions, the huge, huge issue, uh, lack of will and interest, you know, by, by mainly um, the U.S. in many, in many perspectives, um, especially sanctions. You know, we saw President Moon Jae-in really, really tried to implement many inter-Korean projects, but because of sanctions, a lot of these um, were, were not possible. So we need to get some more sanctions exemptions in certain areas. So that's very important. Then, of course, the lack of trust between the two Koreas. That's something that is going to take a lot of time to build, to rebuild. Um, and then words versus actions. That's also very very important. It's not enough to simply state the desire to cooperate, which is exactly what 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 is currently being done by the governments, both in Seoul and in Washington. They're just saying, okay, of course, the door to dialogue is open. We are ready to talk. But, you, you know, in reality, if you look at it from North Korea's perspective, again, you may completely disagree with North Korea's perspective, but it is a fact. It's a reality. This is how they think. You know, if nothing has changed politically, policy-wise, these words mean absolutely nothing to North Korea, and their disinterest will remain the same. So that that's the problem. And then, of course, um, also, in many ways, lack of domestic political support for many of, the, of these initiatives, um, especially in current times when tensions are very high and where young people uh, have, you know, bigger bigger issues on, on, their, on their minds. So moving forward, the focus should be on education, raising awareness, promoting alternative ways of seeing cooperation with North Korea. So changing those, you know, terms that we saw from nuclear and missile to, you know, different things, things, you know, reminding people that real people do live in North Korea. North Korea is not just about weapons and missiles, right? Um, teaching the concept of green detente at schools um, and related concepts. Um, creating more opportunities to involve the youth in discussions and real policies regarding green cooperation with North Korea and the making of the DMZ into a peace zone. Um, the importance of going beyond the political issues and rem reminding people, what, what I just said, yeah, including, um, including the youth, that North Korea is not just about <laughs> nuclear weapons, but it's a real country and they have similar problems as us, including environmental issues. Yep. <laughs> if the government is serious about wanting to deepen humanitarian and cultural environmental exchanges, the proper environment must be created. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnell Nim. Is it Yong Chan Nim now? So, Yong Chan Lee, can you deliver the your presentation? <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm going to present on the sustainable green detente strategy and the role of future generations. My name is Yong Chan Lee. Before I present, let me introduce myself. I am currently studying politics and diplomacy at Yonsei University, and I have been working at uh, the Korean Peninsula policy consensus for two years and uh, numerous uh, seminars and events uh, I got involved in uh, and I was able to interact with many North Korean defectors and also many people who are interested on the Korean Peninsula issues. So I'd like to share uh, 
my insight. So let me go back to uh, uh, the reality here. Ray Dalio is the CEO of Bridgewater Associates, a major hedge fund, and uh, he is very exceptional in implementing the hedge fund strategies. And uh, he, in about two weeks, uh, two weeks ago, he published a book, and uh, he defined six stages that lead up to a war. And according to him, uh, the world today is on stage six, right before uh, the brink of war. So we all feel that the international political landscape is not peaceful. There is a war in Ukraine with Russia. And Xi Jinping has successfully uh, secured a third term, and there are elections in Taiwan, and there was an election in the United States. And uh, with such uh, political landscape in place, it's very difficult to achieve a detente. But detente is about communicating and having dialogues and easing tensions. But given the very dark international political landscape, the potential for reaching a detente seems to be quite bleak. Uh, but this is the reality, and because of that, we really need to look at things from a longer-term perspective, especially in policymaking. We need to be ready when the international political landscape is advantageous for reaching a detente with North Korea. So in order to have a long-term strategy, we need to have the right uh, environment in place. And I think there are three conditions that are uh, very essential to achieving success of detente. So we need consent, consent and willingness on the part of DPRK, and we need clear strategies and countermeasures. But I'm going to focus on the third uh, condition, which is the continued interest on the part of the young generation on this very issue. So. The young generation here will be living uh, for maybe 20 to 30 years uh, longer than uh, the people who are the older uh, generation. And so we really need to take an interest in the issue at hand. So how can we attract the attention of the younger generation? I am a member of the Generation Z, and I think there are two things that are essential. First is the perception that environment and inter-Korean reconciliation are very important issues and are relevant to me. That perception is essential. And uh, the Green Detente strategy should be able to give this perception to uh, the young generation. And second are incentives. And uh, I want to focus on the economic incentive. So what sort of economic incentive can we get out of participating in the Green Detente strategy? So these two are necessary in order for us to get the younger generations buy in on the importance of uh, a successful detente. And I think if you look at uh, this graph, it shows the uh, top social issues that may negatively impact on the younger generation 10 years down the road. And the young generation uh, responded to this question. And uh, many people cited environmental pollution, natural disasters, and energy issues. And these three are very relevant to the individuals. And in fact, we were all born where climate change uh, has already taken place quite a bit. And uh, we have all uh, you know, known maybe two major seasons, uh, summer and winter, and we haven't really experienced spring and fall as the older generations have. And because of the pandemic, we've been masked, um, you know, for several years now. So for us, environment and energy issue and natural disasters are issues that are very, very relevant to us. And we've been hearing about climate warming for uh, a long time, ever since we got into school. So this is something that we can um, we can empathize with. 
And uh, in fact, many of the younger generation are very conscious about environment issues, even when they make buying uh, choices. And ESG management has become a key topic because the Z Gen Z are very much environmentally conscious. And the second is fairness and human rights. So the MZ generation are recognizing important social issues, especially gender gap and fairness. And this is quite different from our previous generations. And I think this is an opportunity as much as these are a crisis. Although we are very interested in human rights, our generation is not really interested in North Korea. Uh, and uh, when I look around, there are a few friends of mine who can, uh, who I can discuss North Korean issues with because no one's interested. And although I am a supporter of reunification, there are many friends who are not supportive. And I told my father about this, and uh, my father said, "Oh, you are." You know, you, you young people really do not know the importance of reunification. Uh, but, you know, that's how different our perspectives are. And as other speakers have already mentioned, uh, the young generation do not really see North Koreans and South Koreans as being of one nation. We never really had a positive experience of North Korea. Of course, the older generation have experienced the 1988 uh, Seoul Olympics, and maybe other experiences may have been some uh, had some positive aspects. But we had uh, many military provocations, uh, such as in Yeonpyeonggun and uh, Cheonan, uh, you know, military vessel. Uh, explosion and there have been a slew of missile launches. So it's very difficult for the young generation who've experienced all of these provocations to see North Korea as potential friendly neighbor. Although uh, we do see that North Korean issues may be uh, important, we don't see it as uh, important and we don't feel the potential for a reunification is as large as the older generation may may see him and uh, economic instability is another issue that the MZ generation feels very closely at heart in the earlier generations you know getting married and finding secure employment have been something that was a given but now it's not so so I think this these issues weigh on us far more than North Korean issues so I think these key issues uh, drive the needs of the future generations. And one is environmental issues. The second is fairness and human rights. And the third is economic instability. And we need to, uh, the green detente strategy should not be focused on North Korea. It should be an other way around. We need to have North Korean issues that focus on green detente. And uh, we, most of the people, if there is a lack of motivation, they will not really take action. So we need to really provide an incentive for young generation to participate in the green detente strategy. So we need a clear vision as to what the young generation can get out of a green detente strategy. First, uh, it can help environmental issues that concern me. And second, it helps the vulnerable groups in North Korea. Uh, and third, it helps me make economic economic gains in the long term. So I think all of these three have to be very clear uh, in order for the young generation to be supportive of the green debt town strategy. So you might wonder what specific in incentives I'm talking about. So there is an example of a company called Superbin and they wanted to solve the issue of low recycling rate of plastics by reorganizing the value chain. So they they can actually classify plastics into grade one, two, and three. So grade one is easy to recycle, two and three, two, difficult to recycle, and three, you can't recycle. So 
if you look at the paper cartons, 74% are grade one, so easy to recycle. But when it comes to plastic bottles, 86% are grade two, which is difficult to recycle. Now, this plastic bottle, you know, it, it's not properly labeled, but you actually have to remove the cap in order to uh, properly recycle this plastic bottle. But most of the consumers don't go through that you know, trouble. So these recycling companies have to do it themselves. And because they are subsidized by the government, uh, they have no incentive to improve any behavioral change uh, on the part of the consumers or change their practices. So Social Bean wanted to reorganize this recycling, mar waste recycling market. So they saw that consumers could potentially be a participant in the recycling, uh, recycling process. So the consumers may be incentivized to remove the cap and all the labels before they throw away the plastic bottles. And then they would uh, assess the economic value of the recyclable waste. And the AI robot can be utilized to do so. And the AI robot, after evaluating the value of the recycled waste, then that robot can compensate uh, the consumer for throwing more recyclable waste. And that would then incentivize the consumers to actively uh, practice good recycling practices in order to earn compensation. And I think. Providing such incentives can have people voluntarily participate in the process. But it doesn't have to be necessarily the government that provides all the incentives. I think the right environment needs to be in place. We need to have maybe private sector companies get involved. Uh, and maybe we can come up with creative ways in which we can incentivize people to join in. Now, in conclusion, the existing rhetoric was that North Korea has dire human rights situations and things need to improve uh, and uh, we are actually one nation. Well, that rhetoric uh, may not be something that young generation can agree to and that rhetoric probably will not be very persuasive as younger people um, become members of the government and become the policy makers. So we need to provide economic and non-economic incentives so that the younger generation can see the benefits of participating in the Green Detente strategy. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I think all the presenters ended within 15 minutes. Now we will have our designated discussants who will join us and I would like to invite Jang Jung hoon to discuss. And you can have a designated discussion on Ms. Kim Konju's presentation. It's great to be here. I am from Hanse University. My name is Jang Kyung hoon Thank you very much for inviting me to such a distinguished event to talk about this issue. I am not a person studying unification academically, but I am here as a youth living on the Korean Peninsula. I believe that we need to talk about something that was discussed from session one is this interest or non-interest of the youth. I believe that going forward, the youth should have a reason to be interested in green detente or for uh, the unification. As was mentioned by Ms. Konju Kim, I believe that a lot of the youth think that the unific that this current division is a normalized state. And if there were the youth uh, that went to the military service and they were actually in charge, even the situation would not be much different. It is because our generation, I believe, has the least interest in unification among the all generations. I think that you should think about the characteristic of the MG generation. We invest in the story of the brand and we actively promote ourselves on social media. Why do people consume brands? It's because they 
have a desire to emphasize themselves with the brand and to become one. And I think MZ generation has a great desire to do so. Becoming that brand itself, being immersed in the brand and living as the brand is very important for them. Apple Patagonia and Tesla, those brands are the brands that actually induce the customers and those brands use social media actively to express themselves. Brands have different stories and the ways of expressing the stories can be done also through campaigns. As was mentioned by Ms. Gonju Kim, regarding the sh uh, sh uh, sharp zero waste vlog plugging and vegan, I think will attest to this also. The MZ generation puts importance on emotions and on um, photos and music cow and art tech and story crowdfunding. They use many different methods to invest themselves in the con uh, contents and they make investments there too. Kim Gonju also mentioned that the MZ generation is interested in climate change and I think it's a good idea to think of unification as an attractive brand that the youth, young generation wants to invest in. They put importance on human rights, they're interested in environment, and they know the seriousness of the climate issue problem. However, they don't want just dry numbers. They want a story that can move their hearts. So I believe that branding uh, unification is very important. So unification for the environment, for example, uh, something like that. Currently. I believe that the word unification has been branded in a negative light. There is YouTube content about uh, North Korea and we had 5 million views and uh, countless likes. And this shows that the Korean Peninsula and the, the, the situation of South Korea is uh, something we should be grateful for and we should go for unification. Also, regarding the unification, I believe that we have had many negative sentiments and uh, negative atmosphere surrounding it. I believe that if we promote the fact that we can think about the future and talk with North Koreans as friends, maybe that would be a good idea. And we could create a good atmosphere with North Koreans. and. We should be curious about the North Korean nature because it's something unseen until now. So I think we should come up with a culture that can accomplish this. I think there should be a culture where we think of North Korea in a fun and positive light. I believe that the word unification can um, approach us in a warm light. And if it can touch the hearts and sentiments of the youth, I believe that the youth will be willing to invest more in unification. Social media, YouTube algorithms are how the youth absorb um, information and data, and they are actually used to ver um, this type of uh, algorithm, and they are very accustomed to their favorite YouTube creators, and they're used to getting information in this method. I believe that uh, in addition to the collaborative program that you have mentioned, I believe that content creation should be actively pursued and encouraged. We could talk about, for example, an individual in North Korea, or we could talk about what will be good if we have unification and what are the perspective toward unification by YouTube creators and influencers that will be very important. And like what we saw through the artistic director's uh, videos, I think we should have videos, food, and clothes that can touch our hearts and that can actually move the hearts of the youth. Also, I believe that we should think of having more content created from a government perspective. I would like to conclude. I believe that for the youth generation, in order for the youth to become more interested in green detente, they should think about unification in a more positive light and in a fun light. And there should be more content that think about unification so that youth are more willing to invest in the brand of unification. And I believe that the government and youth should work hard toward this direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I would like to invite Kim Nan. And uh, she's going to comment on Jack Greenberg's presentation. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Ran Kim, currently majoring in Conflict Analysis and Resolution Program. Um, thank you for your excellent presentation. I enjoyed it very much, as I am sure the audience did as well. Much of what you spoke about today, I am in full agreement, so I will limit my response to some key areas of discussions and finish with a few questions, please. Uh, first, I agree that climate change has been a rising issue all over the world. Your idea of connecting North and South Korea through the impact of climate change is an intriguing and important point. It is also very, it is also very relevant to the Korean Peninsula and even the great, greater population in Asia, which due to most population living along the littorals, uh, they are great affected by climate change and rising sea levels. Indeed, um, turning North, North Korea's focus from its nuclear weapons to something it may be willing to compromise on is extre extremely important. This point was echoed by the director of the Center for Global Governance at the Osan Institution for Policy Studies in Seoul when he stated there is no other areas in which North Korea wishes for and pursues international cooperation with such a proactive and open attitude as it does on environmental policy. I also fully agree with your uh, statement, climate cooperation as a fundamental, fundamental building block towards restoring trust and building confidence between two Koreas. Yes, trust between the two Koreas is almost non-existent at the moment, so cooperation on climate change may help deal with large pro protracted social conflict and even help eventually transform it into something more positive. Uh, it may also help reduce what could be pre perceived as North Korea's defensive behavior. Uh, for example, if we look at intellectualization theory, which is a defense mechanism used to block or deal with conf confrontation in a conflict and its associated emotional stress or even stated in, or even state stress, we can see that this method may help change the focus from its defensive behavior uh, towards and position on nuclear weapons. Uh, furthermore, the idea of connecting climate change and Korean unification is unique. And the example about the col collaboration of Israel and Palestine on climate change provides a positive vision or what, what could be refer referred to as climate, climate diplomacy for North and South Korea. However, at least when it comes to Israel and Palestine, the cooperation is currently in deadlock due to real politic issue. Um, uh, like, the, like in the case of Israel and Palestine, even though North Korea has signed various environmental agreements, uh, such as a UN Framework Con Convention on Climate Change, 1997 Kyoto Protocol, uh, there is a problem of trust. Of course, North Korea could become a beneficiary country um, that receives financial and technological assistance from advanced economics for climate change and cooperation. Therefore, we need to discern whether North Korea is actually willing to take a seat on the table and follow through on current and future promises in regards to climate change. Uh, finally, I would like to ask a few initial questions, please. Um, first, um, can you uh, give an example of a great new trust building initiative when it comes to climate change, something that is small enough to manage and help ensure success. And second, I am not an expert, but I believe there are technological parts of climate change which not only can benefit, benefit the econo economy of North Korea, but could possibly be used for military purpose, dual use technologies. How can we help prevent that from happening? The third one is the current, situ the current sanctions don't allow the international community, community to support investment needed for North Korea to work with South Korea in climate change. How do we navigate these sanctions while still thinking of security? And for last, what would you consider success when it comes to North and South Korea climate initiative? 
Once again, your presentation was excellent and, I, and helped broaden my insight on this issue. I believe that finding unique initiatives such as those under the umbrella of environmental issue are very important to build trust and cooperate. Uh, as a conflict analysis and resolution young scholar, we are always looking to looking at new ways to bridge the differences between North and South Korea and transform relationships. And the idea you gave today did just that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to ask Ji He Che to talk about Gabriella Bernal's presentation as a designated discussant. First of all, I would like to talk about my media outlet for you to understand why I am here. We are 58 years old and we provide information to construction industry and for the past many years, we have been disclosing only our information to the paying subscribers and with the Min Jae-in administration and Berlin uh, um, declaration, uh, North Korea became a very important issue for the construction industry. So in 2019, our organization actually uh, allowed me to get my PhD in North Korean study in Chungang University and asked me to actually make a uh, my studies in this area and at that time I was an active participant and at that time there were some companies that were friendly toward North Korea like Hyundai Group and there were other companies that had task force teams and had different projects in North Korea but just in three years time we are faced with this situation and before I came here to this event there were some people in the companies who actually worked in different uh, task force teams uh, working with North Korea. And I asked about any ongoing research or collaboration with North, Co North Korea in different businesses and economy uh, and economic efforts. Well, I heard that almost all of those collaborative projects were on hold. And I recognize that the company's interest in North Korea is waning and the companies are very worried because now North Korea has uh, nuclear weapons and if the government stance is unclear, then the companies have no reason to invest. So a lot of the people in the industry had said that uh, it will be very difficult to talk about economic uh, cooperation with North Korea for the next even decade. And the companies believe that 10 years is a very long time when there is uncertainty, so they will not just make any investment. So I thought that was food for thought. Regarding the terminology green detente, well, I got to know about this term um, and studied it, it with this forum. And I think when we have good relations, um, well, we don't talk about green detente often because there are other projects that can be more profitable. But during Im Young Bak Park Geun Hye administration and um, the current Yoon Seong Yeol administration has inherited this policy, and they don't. These three administrations don't have a good relationship with North Korea yet. So I believe that those regimes had their characteristics. And on my way here, our media outlet said, well, do you really need to go there to talk about green detente when things have been souring between the two Koreas? But I thought that maybe if companies cannot be involved for the next decade, I believe that maybe the youth can fill up that vacuum and talk about the importance of green detente in a non-political uh, way and non-economical way, so it will be very valuable in that respect. I believe the function of the DMZ will be very important. 
DMZ was actually developed to ease military tensions and collisions between the two Koreas, and the primary function of DMZ has not changed. That is why we need to have less tension uh, politically and militarily between the two Koreas for us to talk about how we can utilize DMZ. That is the reality. However, um, I don't agree with the fact that a lot of the people are saying that talking about DMZ utilization is worthless when we have high military tension. I believe that green the tongued discussions can be more noteworthy at this time. It's because we can talk about how we can peacefully utilize DMZ in different areas that are independent from military tension or sanctions. I and this was mentioned many times by the, the presenters that we need to have discussions about how we can utilize DMZ going beyond the nation uh, and have a transnational plan so that we can improve the health situation and environment collaboration. We believe that using the media can be a very effective way to promote that the youth has very pure interest in DMZ and having a youth organization to promote DMZ Grin the Tongue will be a good idea and I believe that this will be a good way for the people of South Korea to continue their interest in North Korea and while listening to the different presentations I think that my presenter talked about challenge uh, that we have a lot of challenges and I truly agree and I believe for the youth talking about green the tongue should be something that is not just limited to Korea but there are countries such as Japan Taiwan and others that are linked geographically so I hope that the youth in different countries can vocally voice their support for green the tongue so that this can be a good backdrop when we have better relations with North Korea. I hope that within DMZ, um, maybe we can ease some of the uh, sanctions. So maybe this can be a part of that effort. And I hope that the government's keen interest and support will be continued. And I hope that venues such as today can be more actively promoted. And I hope that the Ministry of Unification will continue on with efforts such as today to promote the importance of green the tongue for youth. Thank you very much. I would like to ask Peter Ward to give your designated discussion. Let me first thank the Unification Ministry and uh, DMZ Global Forum Secretariat for inviting me. I just uh, looked at the PowerPoint and uh, and uh, uh, you know drafted my discussion points based on that. But uh, uh, let me continue with some of the comments. Well. We have to think about uh, the participation, and uh, the students have uh, mentioned uh, the conflict resolution theories to understand uh, the participation. But uh, uh, participation, is it about creating a support base, or is it mobilization of people, or is it something that's initiated by in connection with the government and the CSOs? Uh, so I think uh, I lack expertise in many areas and also the general public are not experts in environmental issues or the discharge of water or deforestation. There may be many people who are really lay people when it comes to these issues. And uh, if we ask them to participate and give them the right to oppose certain policies, I think that might actually serve to obstruct uh, policy making and implementation in a sense. So I think we need to take a look at this issue from that perspective also. So even within a democratic system, there are, of course, the po political leaders and there are administrative uh, body and there are private sector and also the civilian uh, society. 
And they have power, but the general public are often just mobilized uh, without having much expertise or knowledge. And uh, which is why general public are often just left disinterested because they don't really know about the issue at hand. Of course, it's great to paint a picture of this vision or the dream of creating the peace zone, the DMZ, but uh, we have to look at the realities. And in the case of greenhouse gases and climate change, of course, can have a negative impact on North Korea. But North Korea, they did not really contribute to these problems. Had they contributed, they probably have developed their economies much uh, in a much more advanced manner than they have thus far. So I think they were not really contributors to climate change or greenhouse gas emissions. So they probably don't have to um, contribute much to solving it. But they are exposed to the risks of the impacts of climate change. But will they be so willing to invite the South Korean counterparts to enter their territory? And uh, would they be willing to invite the South Korean experts to inspect their environmental facilities? Uh, and get them to influence their policy making. I'm very skeptical about that potential. Uh, but even if it's not climate change, uh, there are other issues such as illegal fishing or fine dust problem uh, that may be something that uh, North Korea might be more interested in dealing with. And uh, I think uh, North Korea has exported coal, which uh, uh, has been supplied to China, and that has caused and exacerbated fine dust problems in South Korea. So uh, there are these issues that may be discussed, and also the deforestation and the abuse of the floodgates that have a negative impact on South Korea. However, in most cases, for the power, or for the people in power in North Korea, they have an interest in maintaining the status quo because the fishing rights have been sold by North Koreans to Chinese fishermen and they have earned Chinese yuan as a result. And for North Korea, that's beneficial. And this may be beneficial uh, to, to the people in power in North Korea, but have a co negative consequence on the Korean fishing uh, community and probably also North Korean fishing community. But again, those in power would like to maintain that kind of a business, so they will probably not leave it on the negotiation table with South Koreans. And also, they, these are really closely relevant to the survival of the vulnerable um, classes. But for example, the deforestation issue caused by illegal cultivation of forests. Now, this is something that I don't think South Koreans can easily discuss because North Korean vulnerable groups due to food shortage, they are motivated to cultivate these lands. And without an alternative solution offered, Will it be possible for the two governments to agree on something to stop such illicit farming in the forest lands? So on the surface of things, dealing with these environmental issues to improve relations with North Korea uh, may have some potential, but if you actually look at the specifics of the situation, it's going to be very challenging to come up with solutions. With that, I would like to conclude my comments.
Thank you very much. And we have Kiwan Park, who will have a general discussion and not a designated discussion. Thank you very much. I think everyone is probably a little bit tired and uh, drowsy after lunchtime. And you can see that my hair is shaved. And maybe this is a funny story. Well, I'm going to the army in two days. So that is why I shaved my head. So it's not because I made a, a big uh, decision about something. And we have the inter-Korean divide and I have to go to the military. So that is stark reality. So that has made me have this bald head. So that was just a story to wake you up after lunchtime. And we heard from the different presentations and different uh, designated uh, discussions. So I would just like to ask a few questions. And I know that discussions require critical thinking and questioning. So I hope that the presenters, panelists can answer my questions and give me uh, some of your takes. Regarding the political situation surrounding uh, the Korean Peninsula, it is very unstable. Inter-Korean relations have become more complicated due to the U.S.-China conflict and North Korea's provocations have continued every day in recent years. Therefore, it can be said that the task of unraveling the tight inter-Korean relations is our task. On the other hand, the younger generation plays a more important role than ever as the leaders of the future that will lead the future of the Korean Peninsula. Therefore, inter-Korean relations will be a topic that needs to be resolved centering on the youth because they will be the leaders in the future. However, the youth are engrossed in securing overall stability of life, making it difficult to focus on inter-Korean relations. And in this regard, it is necessary to pay attention to the point of what is common. First is the DMZ. Since the DMZ is a space shared by both North and South, sustainable development can be achieved if the DMZ is made not only for the exchange of peace, but also as the peace place of opportunity between the youth of the South and North. Second is the climate crisis. The climate crisis is a problem facing not only the South and North, but also the global community. In fact, the damage caused by the climate crisis to North Korea is quite seriously, according to our estimation. As a result of such damage, the food shortage in North Korea is having a huge negative impact on the lives of its residents. For this reason, North Korea has been adding various international cooperation efforts to resolve climate crises, such as by the United Nations, FCC, Paris Convention, and Kyoto Protocol. However, the limitation of North Korea's cooperation is that from South Korea's point of view, it is passive. For example, prior discussions with North Korea are essential when thinking about ways of utilizing the DMZ or conducting cooperation to resolve the climate crisis between the two Koreas. But if their ongoing non-communication still exists, the situation cannot progress. Even if North Korea agrees to cooperate, we cannot help but doubt the sincerity of their will to cooperate. For example, I actually learned this through covering uh, some news because there was a project to send seedlings to North Korea to resolve deforestation and to have greenification in North Korea. However, what happened to the seedlings, which um, was that they were used as wood for heating by the North Korean residents. So the results were not achieved. The intended results were different from what was um, actually done. So if the results are different from the intended ones like this case, public opinion can be more pessimistic than before. So I believe that if um, need to recognize the limitations through critical thinking and supplement and improve them so that the peaceful prosperity of the Korean Peninsula can be accelerated. Thank you very much. And with this, we have listened to the five discussants. Once again, thank you very much for your efforts. I know that you were very good timekeepers and I would like to invite our panelists to answer or comment on the comments or questions by your designated 
this custom. So I will give each panelist three to four minutes. So I would like to ask Miss Konju Kim. Well, I think your comments were very informative and insightful. And regarding what was just said, I would like to answer. And I would like to also answer to my designated discussion. We see continued provocation by North Korea. And I think inter-Korean relations have really deteriorated to uh, maybe an unprecedented level. And can we really trust North Korea as an issue? And when we have chance to talk to them, is really humanitarian aid going to benefit the North Korean residents directly. So I think that is a realistic issue we need to grapple with. However, I think this can be a very naive type of thinking, but not giving any humanitarian aid because of that suspicion or acting within just political limitation will lead to more problems with North Korea and going forward, I believe that the role of youth will become more narrowed. That is why I believe that going forward, as was mentioned in my presentation, for the vulnerable in North Korea, we should have non-military, non-political humanitarian aid, which will lead to more trust with North Korea and to continue to have communication channel with them. and. We heard from the last discussant as well, that and Pai Kyungwon as well. So the youth like branding and they like stories and they believe that unification should be a brand that can um, actually speak to them and be worthy of their value. So at our association, we went to uh, we entered a content contest and we needed to make some unification contents and the people there were there because they were interested in North Korea but the content consumers would be the youth that are not much interested in North Korea so the youth needed to make those contents as a contest and what was important at the time was to uh, let the youth know what was the situation for people in North Korea and individual and how we could help them. So in my case, it was One Child, One Milk, which was a slogan that I had. And at that time, it was a very concrete case. And making that video very specific was very important. And I felt at that time that contents could be very influential. And going forward, uh, another point I want to make is that for the children living in North Korea, well, I did not recognize that they were a they were not able to even drink one glass of milk a day. But we had some teenagers from North Korea uh, at that event, so I believe that green the tongue, the role of youth and others, well, that is very important. And there are some people that are out of North Korea now, so I think we should also include them into the conversation. So I think we should think about the role of the youth that have actually um, defected or are out of North Korea. And we can hear from them about why humanitarian support can be important to them and why Green Detente should be important because we can be friends with them going forward. So that is a point I wanted to make. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jack Greenberg. Can you comment on the discussion? I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Kim for her very excellent remarks and also for the tough questions. Um, I would say, I think, first of all, we have to look at very small, low-hanging fruit for what would be success. I think aiming for huge projects at this time wouldn't be advisable. I think um, at a minimum, when it comes to things like river flow management, uh, Success looks like dialogue, um, which isn't happening right now. Uh, success at a minimum would be having the North let the South know when it's going to open its floodgates uh, amidst heavy rainfall. I think also 
we need to think about um, disaster planning, which can happen, but only if there is dialogue. And that do, that's something that doesn't necessarily require technology transfer. Um, I think your question about how do we navigate the obstacles that sanctions poses is uh, an interesting question. And I'm certainly not an expert when it comes to sanctions and um, the logistics of them, but I would expect that there would need to be very careful due diligence um, if any technology was to be transferred, uh, both within the government in South Korea and in lockstep coordination with uh, bodies like the United Nations. Um, so I think at a minimum, those things need to happen before uh, we can move forward. But I would say for personally, um, dialogue has to come first and without dialogue, we're in operating in a void. Um, thank you. 네, 감사합니다. Thank you very much, Gabriella. Discussant for um, her comments and all the other discussants as well because um, made for a very interesting uh, debate. And so uh, the discussant mentioned uh, various interesting things including how this concept of the green detente has actually been um, ongoing now for three governments. And that actually um, is an interesting point because although this has um, been ongoing for many years now under various administrations, there's still, um, there's still a lot of room for improvement. There's still a lot that can be done. There's still um, a lot of um, limitations as we can see. And not just this idea of green detente, but if we look at overall the goal to make the DMZ a peace zone, um, that's something that came way before, before that. It got more attention now under the, the Moon Jae-in administration, but it's something that actually has been you know, um, proposed a long time ago. So that's something that um, has been a long goal over many administrations in South Korea, and um, it would be you know, good to you know, one day see, see that uh, those goals come to fruition. And of course, um, multiple uh, discussants um, asked the question is, is it even worth talking about you know, green detente um, amid such tensions, you know, North Korea firing all these missiles and, and the security situation at the DMZ seeming worse than ever. Um, is it worth talking about? Um, but I think what's important is that um, what, what Jack just said also is that, you know, how do we measure like success? Um, are we expecting to immediately, you know, sign some big agreement and have some um, a big um, improvement in, in, in these uh, environmental projects immediately, you know, implement these huge projects. That's something that's probably not going to happen, um, like, like you said. But, uh, you know, simple communication on these matters and, and simple, like, will of, by North Korea showing ca some kind of interest, that already would be a big, uh, big win. And then also uh, the discussion mentioned the role of the media. That, I think, is also very important. The media is very crucial, I mean, especially in a country like South Korea that where the media has, has become increasingly divisive. The media is very important in really um, getting uh, that message across to the people that, yeah, North Korea is not just about you know, the missiles and because and, they really do help shape the narrative around Nor North Korea. So it would definitely be helpful if the media could um, try and, and, and also provide different perspectives instead of only, you know, the, the negative news about nuclear weapons and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, the sanctions, talk about the sanctions that um, it would be good to lift sanctions, at least within the DMZ area. I also think that is very important and I think that um, should, be, should be considered um, by the UN at the UN level and that that should be, um, should be allowed for the sake of you know, building trust, at least making a foundation. You know, even if North Korea has, doesn't quote unquote deserve it, you know, let, I'm sure a lot of people would think that, oh, why should we, you know, make concessions first and North Korea didn't do anything um, to, to deserve that. But if you look at it at a big, in a bigger picture from a long-term perspective, especially by the younger generation who has to live with North Korea for many more decades, it's not really about does North Korea deserve you know, the, the, for us to, to make concessions. Um, but it, it's about, you know, what is best for the future of the Korean Peninsula, for the future of these uh, the next generations, and for long-term peace. Um, okay, I'll, yes, I'll keep it.
First of all, I believe there were three questions, and I think they were very insightful questions. Uh, those questions actually related to some things that I did not think of in advance, so thank you very much for those. So let me go uh, through them one by one. The first one was how much authority or right should be given to the citizens? And I think uh, on that question, uh, since I am just a student in an undergrad program, so I'm not going to cite any theories, but based on my own experience, I would like to say that just creating some sort of a supportive opinion amongst the young generation uh, towards reunification or green detente would in and of itself be quite meaningful. Uh, Korea uh, achieved democratization and uh, we impeached a president. And so we have many democratic assets in us. And there is this uh, belief that we can actually have an influence through the democratic system on the government. Uh, so I think if we can just create a public opinion in support of the Green Detente, much can be achieved. And right now, we do not have many uh, systems or institutions in place where uh, uh, a great authority is delegated to the, the public itself. I think right now, so the big thing would be to create a supportive uh, public opinion. And uh, secondly, you talked about the international uh, political landscape, and I do agree that the international political landscape is not very favorable towards green detente. Nevertheless, we do need to prepare ourselves. I don't believe that the international political landscape will improve anytime soon, and I'm not sure when North Korea will come to the negotiating table, but we do have to get ourselves ready for that, for that when that time should come. And COVID-19 came to us without us expecting it, but um, we responded to the challenge, and I think the same goes uh, for this situation. We need to get ourselves ready uh, so that we can uh, respond accordingly. And also you mentioned that uh, these issues are directly relevant to the survival of the vulnerable groups in North Korea. And uh, how can two governments deal with that issue? Uh, they can't just negotiate and make decisions that might negatively impact the survival of the vulnerable groups. I agree. Uh, so we need to also see the vulnerable groups in North Korea as citizens of South Korea. And we need to always keep in mind the uh, uh, the well-being of the North Korean uh, disadvantaged groups so that we can flexibly accommodate their needs as we proceed with our policies towards green detente. Thank you very much. Regarding our panelists and our discussants, well, do you have any other comments that you would like to make? or any questions? Well, we are very good with timekeeping, so I think we have some minutes left. Maybe, Gabrielle, uh, are you okay? Okay, then I think that we can accommodate questions from the floor, but before that, I was going to ask these questions if we did not have other questions from the floor, but I would like to ask you, and this can be food for thought, because I think inter-Korean relations, well, the tensions have uh, actually been maintained for a long time, and I think one of the key words here was long-term. So we need to look at this from a long-term perspective. Education is important, and media is very important, as was mentioned by Dr. Kim in the previous session that media should be non-political and non-emotive. So there should be a need for objective coverage and there needs to be incentives that are given and it should not be some, uh, it might not be something um, physical, but if it can touch the emotions of the MZ generation, well, I think uh, 
Mr. Jung Hoon Moon mentioned Dream Plus MZ. So DMZ, well, you mentioned that, and I think, I hope that it becomes a reality. So my first question is, what is the future of the Korea Peninsula that you are envisioning? And second question is, after participating in this forum and joining in the different discussions, well, what are you going to do tomorrow? So those are my questions, and now I think we can accommodate questions from the floor. If you raise your hand, we will hand over the microphone to you. And if possible, please state your name and where you're from. And it would be good if the questions are short. And please tell us who you are directing the question to. If you want to comment, then please keep it short. Thank you. I'm a Uri. Oh. Roland Guzman, yeah. The conflict resolution program. The uh, just like the morning session, the afternoon session was was great. Everybody flowed really well together. Um, the, in my lifetime, a little bit older, a little bit older than all of you. My lifetime, I've seen that whether it's us as in academia or the experts or in political life, that we sin, we seem to get stuck in a time cycle, a circle. We go over and over again the same thing. Uh, and you young scholars today, younger than I am at least, the, uh, one of the comments was made about, you know, let's do something small that can be successful. Let's do the low-hanging fruit. And I think that's great, and it is somewhat a dichotomy from what the, the government say when they want to do large projects and spend a lot of money. But I will also submit to you, though, that low-hanging low fruit can also be the rotten fruit. So therefore, we also have to look at moments of ripening to pick the fruit that may not be ripe at the moment, but as you pick it, then you make the opportunity for change to happen. So that's my comment that I have for everybody. Thank you very much for your comment. Anyone else? Hello, my name is Bethel Yilma, and I'm part of the George Mason's Korea's Global Affairs Program. Um, and my question is directed to anybody, uh, but a lot of you guys talked about trust building between North Korea and South Korea, and how um, there is no trust there, and how we could build that onto that. But I wanted to talk about the conversation, how you're going to bring discussions forward. And I was curious because you said there's no discussions right now in the first panel and now here. There's no discussions between North Korea and South Korea. How can we increase that? Because that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, that's what I'm concerned about with this conflict. There is no discussion. How can we start discussion? Anybody? So let me briefly uh, respond to that. I have a very realistic point of view. I think there is little that the Korean government can actually do. I think the larger hegemonic states like China and US have a greater leverage. And uh, they have a great uh, influence on, and the situation in this region. So our voice is not very large. And despite this, if there are certain uh, changes like a pandemic or climate change, there are areas where we could find a niche to raise our voice. Right now, North Koreans are not responding to our uh, approach. But when, let's say, a drought becomes very significant or there is a natural disaster and North Korea faces huge needs for support, I think that's when South Korean government can step in. So right now, there is not much we can do, but we need to get ourselves ready. So when the opportunity uh, lends itself, then we need to step in. Peter Ward, uh, I'll say something even more. Peter Ward? More cynically, uh, even more cynically realistic. Um, I would suggest that there's plenty of room for conversation if it's not if it's not in public. Uh, so if the government is obsessed with photo ops and appealing to the electorate, those conversations are never going to happen. Kim Jong Un doesn't want to give uh, Yoon Seok Yeol free photo ops. But if 
intelligence officials, defense officials, etc., want to meet together in third countries to, to manage a de-escalation, medium term, obviously probably not short term, those conversations can and may be already happening. We don't know what happens behind closed doors. I hope more happens behind closed doors than, than in, in front of us right now. But realistically, and very cynically, the only kinds of conversations that make sense for the North Koreans to have are going to be private and secret. Uh, and we shouldn't expect transparency. We shouldn't expect to be able to hold the government in account, uh, accountable in real time. Because if we do expect that, no conversations will happen. Because Kim Jong-un won't give Yoon Seo-gil that opportunity. Yeah, Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes, do you want to answer? Thank you very much for the interesting question. Well, along with, uh, well, unlike the many panelists here, I am not majoring in this field and I don't have a lot of experience, but after collecting news related to this at our association, for what I felt was that first, realistically speaking, well, we have U.S. midterm elections that have ended and Biden administration's uh, approval, I think, uh, has been changing, and some are voicing that Trump may take over afterwards. And if there is higher possibility of uh, Trump winning the campaign later, later on, then I believe that North Korea can be more aggressive. And I think that they will probably um, heighten the yardstick for uh, inter-Korean or uh, talks with the U.S. if that happens. So I believe that um, maybe uh, carefully, uh, prudently, I would like to voice maybe the U.S. political landscape will be a very great determinant. We also need to think about what kind of dialogue and cooperation we can pursue with North Korea and regarding the sanctions against North Korea, Regarding humanitarian projects uh, that are not affected by the sanctions, I believe that they are still existing. And regarding the potable water sanitation projects that are ongoing, well, I heard that in Hwangye area, half of the residents cannot get access to potable water. So I think regarding the potable water situation, regarding international NGOs and I think for South Korean organizations, there are avenues of cooperation still open. So I think we should not let those opportunities go to waste. So we should use those humanitarian efforts as a medium. Thank you very much. Any other questions, uh, Professor Lim? I would like to comment. As I listen to the discussion, I realize that our view of North Korea is quite dark and uh, pessimistic. But sometimes I think that we may be struggling against our own past. We have a collective trauma, I think, that we're suffering from. Life is a it is is a living thing. It's evolving, and North Koreans are human beings, and there are many uh, real life stories in North Korea too. But we view uh, Kim Jong Un as this uh, this uh, this figure that we have defined, and uh, we define North Korea in a certain way, and we are not unable to break free from that um, framework. But if we look at K-pop right now, I mean, it's very popular, but if we go back maybe seven to eight years ago, uh, were we able to imagine how successful K-pop and K-culture might be as, as we are seeing it unfold these days? No. So I think we need new stories. And the reason why I feel this way is because when I visited North Korea, it wasn't from South Korea, but I was one of a group of American artists who visited North Korea. And I was there and was able to freely engage with the musicians there. 
And uh, I visited them, North Korea, a number of times, and I saw the fashion transition over those uh, years. The way they were doing their makeup evolved, and the way they wore their dresses evolved. So there are people. And, but whenever we talk about DPRK, we all become political experts or development experts, and we just view them from that paradigm, maybe 80 to 90% of the time. Uh, but, but I think there may be the soft sides in DPRK that we might be overlooking. So I think we need to speak with the North Korean defectors, uh, uh, and we need to try to overcome our own collective trauma uh, so that we can come up with new stories. And if this, the citizens have these new stories that we believe in, then pol politicians will also be encouraged to view things from a different perspective. So I think we need a more balanced approach um, to the stories that we're telling about North Korea. Thank you very much for your comments. Any other questions? We have a question from online. DMZ Greenpeace Zone, do you think that will be possible? I would like to hear from non-Korean panelists. So do you think we can have Greenpeace Zone from DMZs? Well, I think we have less than 10 minutes left. So maybe Park Kyu An from the farthest away from me, maybe you can answer any question you would like, including this question that I just asked. So is can you repeat the question? Well, do you think we can make DMZ a GPZ, Greenpeace Zone? I think it will be possible. Of course, we will struggle. We will have challenges. However, I think all the panelists and all the audience are agreeing that we will have an opportunity that will open when we persevere. So I think DMZ has huge potential, and I hope that we have unwavering interest by the Korean people and un continued interest. And I think we should be uh, fast responding and sensitive to different changes in our environment. And if that happens, then we could have joint prosperity, even making the DMZ Greenpeace Zone. Thank you very much. Perhaps uh, it could be possible sometime in the future, but I can't say when, maybe 10 years later or 20 years later, it may be possible. I don't have uh, the power to predict. Jihee Choi. Well, I believe the core would be easing sanctions toward North Korea, and currently there are no concrete measures to do so. North Korea has nuclear weapons, and the U.S. is asking, and they are asking the U.S. to be recognized as a country with nuclear weapons and uh, to release its sanctions. But I don't think Korean Peninsula is capable to resolve this issue. So regarding green detente and the capital and technology that can go into the DMZ area are limited. So when we look at a limited place like the DMZ, maybe in that place with biodiversity and there are the common values and philosophy shared by UN and the international community. So I believe that we can talk about having a place for uh, peace here. And I believe that maybe that is what the Korean government can do. Thank you. Kim Nan. Ron Kim. I would like to respond to the first question that was shared by the moderator. Well, in my view, the peace on the Korean Peninsula would not necessarily be in the form of a reunification. I think we first need to recognize the identity of each other and maintain a positive peace relationship. I think that would be the ideal form of peace on the Korean Peninsula. I believe that on the Korean Peninsula, when we think about peace, 
There are many beautiful places in North Korea, so maybe we can look at them together and we can think about our friends in North Korea and to talk about their environment, their culture, and their environment free from political perspectives. And like on a picnic, I hope that uh, we can reach an era where that is possible. So maybe I'm too emotional, but that is a day I envision. And regarding what I'm going to do tomorrow, I like to write. I like to post many things on social media. So maybe I can write something about unification on the SNS and share it with my friends. Thank you. Well, this might sound different from what I have said thus far. I actually do support reunification and I do feel that we share a common national identity and so I hope that we can become one nation once again, overcome all the differences and challenges thus far. Uh, there are 25 million people in the North Korea, and I hope they are freed from the Kim Jong-un administration. And I hope we can solve the many challenges and problems they face. And I hope the world will become a better place for them as soon as possible. And uh, I hope that I can contribute to achieving that. I have this sense of mission towards the North Korean people, and I am going to work hard and study hard in order to be uh, that person that can contribute to this. Yes. Um, well, if I would have to think about what would be my, you know, in my view, an ideal um, Korean peninsula. Uh, would be one where um, there is no border at the DMZ, where people can move freely between North and South, where there can be freedom of movement, freedom of, of expression, of exchanges between the people. Um, now, how this would look like politically, that's a different question, but you know, the importance is again to look at it from a, from a long-term perspective, from a peace perspective, you know, a Korean peninsula where the war has ended, where there is a peace treaty, you know, that would be something that already would be a big win, even if it wouldn't be specifically a unification um, the way, you know, politically it would be defined. Um, and then regarding the question, um, if uh, green detente is possible, if a green peace zone is possible in the DMZ, um, it would be possible, but there's a lot of conditions for it to be possible, obviously. And, you know, one of those is, again, you know, for countries, the countries involved to look at things not from their own personal, you know, short-term political partisan perspectives, but to look at things from a long-term peace uh, perspective um, for the collective good which is something that you know politicians in every country are are guilty of not doing enough is is looking at the collective good and not just of what would be you know politically expedient for me for my party for my reelection you know if 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 things keep going that way then it will never be possible but you know if someone comes comes along and and changes that well that would be great Greenberg <laughs> Um, I think I'll start by addressing the first question about um, is a green peace zone possible? I, like Peter, I can't predict the future, but I think we're doing the right things to lay the foundation for it. The recent opening of walking and bike trails, at least on the southern side, are something that you know sets a foundation for when the time comes. And uh, I appreciate the professor's comment about ripening fruit, and I think establishing a green peace zone is one of those projects that we do need to ripen over time. Um, with regards to the moderator's questions, um, I think for me personally, um, a vision of the future on the Korean Peninsula would be greater people-to-people -people exchanges, which uh, Professor Im said are so important in working with North Korean refugees um, and teaching them English. It, it's so evident that each of them uh, they're individuals and they have stories to tell. So I do hope to see greater people-to-people -people exchanges um, in the decades and years to come. And there was a comment this morning about uh, how previous generations have talked about Gyeongju and Busan and Nampo and Hamhong uh, with nostalgia when it was one Korea. So I do hope that um, 
when the time is right, um, future generations can talk about those cities as being part of one Korea rather than being either in the north or in the south. And uh, what will I do personally? Um, I think amongst my peers, I, I need to be a bit of a provoker. And when they tell me that they're not interested in unification or that the, the costs will be uh, too much for them to bear, I, I, I need to be someone who can push back on that and help them see the positives and uh, get them to move away from fear mongering and focus on the hope that it that does exist. Thank you. 감사합니다. Well, I would like to answer the two questions that you posed. And I really like K9 and other weapons. And I also worked with the Ministry of Defense um, as one of the ambassadors. And I believe that we are currently, I hope that Korea can become a powerhouse in weapons, but I also hope that we can have a good relationship with North Korea. And as was mentioned by Gabriel, um, that unification education is important. Well, I went to North Korea as a part of Ministry of Education's event. So that is why I became more interested in North Korea. So that was a great opportunity for myself. So I hope that we can have more inter-Korean exchanges. And if you can visit North Korea, that can become your story that can work to um, have more interest in this area. And for tomorrow, well, I will go to work. And there will be different types of exchanges that uh, I can uh, think about what will be the best way going forward. So there is card news that I am currently involved in. So I hope that I can make some more promotional material so that we can persuade the youth generation that inter-Korean exchanges is very important. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I'm just moved by watching you all discuss these very important topics. And I think, uh, you know, great opportunities come to those who dream. So we need to always remember that. As you have heard, you know, uh, people have shared what challenges that they see and what limitations they see, how difficult the situation is at hand. So we all recognize that, but still we have to dream uh, in order for that dream to come true someday. And uh, just as an aside, in 2014, I co-worked with some elite uh, people in North Korea. And uh, North Koreans actually did not want to include South Koreans, but there was this one student and uh, this person sort of uh, worked like a, uh, a transcriber and uh, this person was typing away very quickly and uh, in the break time, the Google Earth was uh, opened on her computer and everyone was there looking at Google Earth. And uh, these North Koreans tried to uh, find out, locate their own homes in Pyongyang. And so, because, and this was an elite group of students and uh, these were young elite um, people and uh, there was this South Korean uh, person with access to the computer uh, who was showing them Google Earth and all the North Korean students coming in to check their location on that map. Anyway, I think uh, we need to dream for a future where we can all get together and, and communicate. And uh, thank you very much for taking an interest and uh, making this panel discussion very fruitful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, moderator panelists and discussants, a big hand for the great session. Please go back to your seats. Well, during the opening ceremony, we heard uh, a congratulatory address uh, that was hopeful about the results of today's Forum. And I think today we were able to actually accomplish that because we had very insightful and valuable discussions about green detente, inter-Korean relations, and the role of the youth. This is the first year that we're holding the 2022 DMZ 
Global Forum for Young Leaders, and I hope that we can continue with this forum, and I hope that there can be a day when we can have Green Peace Zone on the DMZ. With this, we will conclude the 2022 DMZ Global Forum for Young Leaders. Thank you very much, all the participants who have graced us with your presence, as well as our YouTube viewers who have joined us despite the long day. Also, we have questionnaires in the booklets that you have received, uh, the, those who are here on site. And if you can fill them out and give them on your way out, it would be greatly appreciated along with your translation receivers. Also. You can join in our YouTube viewers. You can also fill out a questionnaire online as well. You can find today's recorded version on the Ministry of Unification's UniTV YouTube channel. If you missed a session or a presentation or would like to revisit it again, please do so. And on Monday, on the 20th of uh, actually, on the 21st of November, on Monday, we will have our main forum, the DMZ International Forum. And this is the fifth anniversary. It will be held in a border area of Paju City. Lastly, we have nine minutes left for you to participate in the forum live viewing verification event. And if you have not uploaded a uh, verification picture yet, please upload it by 5 p.m. And we will announce the winners of the contest later on. I will need to say goodbye and thank you very much. I was Iyonga, announcer at the Ministry of Unification UniTV, your MC for today. Thank you very much for your participation.